we all will uh, solicit your questions if you have any. All right, so uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanksgiving for this day. We give you thanks for uh, the rain and its season and for uh, the last day of summer. Looking forward to fall. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, keep us all uh, in your hand during these changes of seasons uh, and keep us, Lord, uh, aware of your blessings as you give them uh, in the years that we have. We pray, Lord, also for your blessing on those in need. We especially pray for Doris, for Ruth, for Christine, for Christina and her baby, for Jan, for uh, Kathy and for Megan, asking, Lord, that you be with them in the midst of their challenges that they have for their health, that you would help them, Lord, to uh, on our end, we pray for a miraculous recovery, uh, but we pray, Lord, that uh, as they are in your hands, that you would uh, help them to see in the midst of their challenges that you are there with them and they would find their comfort and their hope in you. And we pray, Lord, for the family of Rita, who we'd prayed for earlier, uh, who passed away. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, give comfort to the family, to their friends, uh, help them to recognize uh, your grace and uh, turn to you in the midst of this loss that they might hear and know and be saved as well. Uh, we pray, Lord, also for Jennifer that you would help her find a new job. And Lord, we give thanks for uh, the birth of Lucy Elizabeth to Carolyn and her family and ask, Lord, that you would help her uh, not only uh, grow healthily, but grow to be a woman after your own heart. And Lord, finally, we pray for all those who don't believe, especially for those members of our family and close friends who do not believe. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us see opportunities if such should arise uh, to speak the truth and love to them. But Lord, that you would work in their lives in whatever way through the people around them, that your word would go forth to them, uh, that you would use people as your masks, that your word uh, would hit them and your spirit connect, uh, wherein to call them to yourself. We pray for those opportunities for them and for your grace to follow. And we ask for your grace to be with us as well in this hour. In Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. Anybody still need a sheet? The new sheet we just handed out. I expect there's a few folks over here. Yeah. Didn't get one. So thank you for braving the, the rain we now have. All right, any uh, questions from last week? Last week we had looked at uh, kind of the world's perspective on this stuff. We looked at their issues regarding uh, how they went all over the place on their understanding of the supernatural and that we had uh, issues related to people getting sucked into the mysteries of the unknown in an unhealthy way, uh, sometimes even on television and also uh, getting into the occult and those kinds of things. And we looked at some of those aspects of the challenges that we're going to see in our nation as witchcraft continues to be one of the fastest growing religions in America, that we are going to see more of this stuff where people are uncritically dabbling in the unseen and are going to end up pulling into themselves uh, demonic interactions that they're not going to be happy with in the end. Um, or that will continue to draw them away from Christ. And we will be looking more at that starting next week, why the devil even does all these things at all, uh, biblically speaking. Uh, any questions from last week or comments? Nobody? <laughs> Nobody has any questions? I mean, this oh, was yeah. You know what? That question was asked last week afterward, too. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what about UFOs? Where does that fit into all of this? And the answer is, I don't know that it does. Other than if the unidentified flying object happened to be angelic or demonic, right? Were it another thing out in the ether of the universe, on one level that falls into like cryptozoology, right? Like an unknown entity out there that we don't understand or know, right? And that means that God's providential reality of creation and redemption applies to them also. 
So on that level, I would say uh, that really it doesn't apply in that way. Uh, the only way it applies if someone argues that because if we encountered an intelligent life out there somewhere, and intelligence, depending on what you mean by that, right, um, that somehow that negates Christianity or the scriptures, which it doesn't. Um, but if someone had a crisis of faith there, certainly the devil could use that to try to draw them away from Christ. And in that way, it would become spiritual warfare. Yeah. Good question. Other, other comments? Yeah, so back Michael. Back in high school when we were studying the Salem witch trials, it was mainly presented that this was literally a witch hunt to attack unpopular people. Any thoughts on that one way or another? Yeah, just the, if you read the transcript of the Salem witch trial, it feels like a witch hunt. You know, that there are issues going on in the, that they don't understand, and therefore who's to blame for our bad position that we have. And so therefore it moves into to, to witchcraft as, as the kind of impetus for that. Was there witchcraft going on in Salem? Very possibly that would be the instigator for them then putting this wide swath on this kind of uh, witch hunt. Uh, but the, you know, a lot of the cues there sound very familiar to like Spanish Inquisition and that kind of stuff and makes it kind of suspect on that level. However, today it is still, you know, now it is one of the witch capitals of, of the world. So, so it has garnered what it once got accused of, it now actually has. So I don't know what you do with that, but that is, that is kind of a, how that has run at this point. Yeah. If the witch is a part of the devil, don't they kind of worship him and bring into their thing or? Uh, it, de it depends on, it depends on the witchcraft. Um, there are some that obviously worship the devil, right? Uh, a lot of witchcraft, though, uh, is just misinformed. So, so they think that they're worshiping or calling on various powerful entities or the, the energies of the universe or dead people, right, ancestors. Uh, and that's, of course, one of the biggest or some kind of form of animism. And when you get outside of, of America and the West, into uh, the global south, when you get into uh, of the far eastern understanding of theology, these, these are still very prevalent understandings of the world. Animism, uh, where you have spirits in kind of everything, uh, where you have, uh, which we looked at last week, right, with um, at the end there, where they accuse, there was a riot at the soccer game because they accused the goalie of trying to, to put a curse on the other team. And it, 10 people died in the ensuing riot on account of the witchcraft, right? Um, and that's the kind of thing that we may end up having here should people really delve into and hold on to these things, right? Um, as we're going to look at today, though, that doesn't mean that they're unlike what a lot of enlightened anthropologists will say, that it's just a bunch of primitive superstition and they're just idiots, right? Which is how they come across, right? All of your enlightened anthropologists and that kind of stuff, that's the move they make is you have these people in these third world countries who are idiots and they're just not as cool and as smart as us. So look at their primitive ways and look down on them for being so primitive, which is just idiocy, okay? But that's where they see it because they're looking at it evolutionary. And we won't get into that anymore really tonight except to say that to argue that is to argue for your own demise because those who don't respect those things are going to then invite those things eventually because they'll create a vacuum wherein those things come into the society, right? So because they see it all as a bunch of nonsense, then if people dabble in it here, they don't care because it's a bunch of nonsense. And then in the end, it starts garnering stuff when people are like, well, maybe this isn't as nonsense as they're making it out to be, right? And as we'll see today, there are even biblically some questions about how nonsensical some of this really is. So. Uh, so we did find a few things. The world at large recognizes that there is a reality beyond what we can sensorily experience. Okay, there, there are almost, other than in the Enlightenment, and I keep putting quotes around that because the more I know about the Enlightenment, the more I doubt that it really is enlightening, um, <clears throat> at least theologically speaking, if not technologically, um, <clears throat> that there are very few atheists in history. 
almost everyone believes in the supernatural. Uh, but divorced from the Bible and biblical truth, we try to figure out something that we can't apprehend or comprehend by our sensory experience. So we're just shooting in the dark. Uh, Western culture then disillusioned with modern, uh, modernist conclusions that science can solve everything. Um, and also disillusioned with established institutions now says, well, I don't believe that science has all the answers, but I also am not going to go to organized religion because they've been demonized by modernism. So now what we have is a distrust of the organized religions as a product of modernism and a distrust of modernism. So you end up with a group that says, well, I'll just depend on myself then and whatever I feel. And uh, so I am spiritual but not religious, which means I will just grab from whatever and make my own thing. Whatever is true for me is true for me. Okay. So the Western world pretends that faith is just a choice of truths among equals. You can just grab what you want. You know the coexist bumper sticker there in the background. Um, <clears throat> we're there we find actually, uh, in fact today in our eighth grade confirmation, we looked at the three laws of logic and how uh, the law of non-contradiction and how that bumper sticker violates that fundamental law of logic. Um, because those are none of those things there, religious-wise, uh, actually, they all claim ex exclusivity, and they can't all be right. So the idea that they can coexist in terms of logic, logical space, is just false. That's just nonsense when it comes to logic itself. Um, so for us to, to have these kinds of things out there, doesn't mean we all have to go to war or something, but the idea that somehow, oh, you can all just get along, as if truth doesn't matter, or there are no truths, right? Um, that leads to a, a life that is not only uh, non-critical, which, which some philosophers argue is not worth living then, but also uh, creates all sorts of problems in your own life. The consequences of your actions, because you have no ethics that are consistent, will just create a nightmare problem for you down the road, which we see by and large in our society today, right? So we want to have a consistent ethic, but we also want to pay attention to the re reality that we have, we are dealing with things we can't see as well. And so how do we attend to those things faithfully as the people of God? Other questions, comments on that? All right, so we're going to open our Bibles today at the Bible study. So one of the things we want to talk, uh, this is really addressing, this whole section is really addressing a couple of things, two things. One is, out of the four views I talked about the first week, one was the dismissive view, that, that uh, there is nothing that's really, miracles don't exist, supernatural doesn't exist, none of that exists. Um, and to remind us that, biblically speaking, uh, that is just baloney. Uh, to use the theological term, not really, but it is baloney. Um, second, what we also want to understand is that as Christians, not only should we regard the supernatural as being real and relevant for our lives, but we, can, we don't have all the answers. That the Bible only speaks about these things as these things intersect with the narrative of our salvation. So the Bible is not a treatise on the supernatural existence of all things as God has created them. That's not how it works. But it does reveal these things as they matter for that narrative regarding us being saved and why we need to be saved. And so there are some things in there that are very essential and fundamental for us to understand. But there are also a lot of other tidbits in there that cause us to recognize that we when it comes to the hand of God acting in the universe, are just still just a piece, a precious piece to God that He has redeemed with His own blood. But we are not the whole story of His work in the world. And so we're going to take a look at a few of those things just to help us think about uh, the wider issues at stake and, the, and some of the work of God that maybe we haven't contemplated before um, that pertain to this topic of the supernatural and spiritual warfare. Okay. So the first one is a familiar one if you turn to Genesis chapter 4. 
Hope that didn't come across on the microphone as big slam, did it? Yeah, I was like, that was right in front of the microphone. I just blew, blew out whoever's <clears throat> gonna watch that. Okay, so uh, chapter four, verse eight. If I can find in here, okay. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Canaan, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So, the blood of Abel, and we even sing this in our hymns, right? Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries. It's one of our hymns. What is going on there? Is God using allegory or imagery here to say the blood or the, the deed that you did, sinfulness, like, like, like I'm aware of it, and it's egregious if someone was shouting. Or does the blood of Abel in some way cry to God because evil has been done? She says both. I don't know, okay? <laughs> because the Bible never really talks about this much again, other than things like all creation groans in the eager expectation of the restoration to come. Well, is it to God, is it actually groaning? I don't know, maybe, right? Or is he using some kind of allegory to just show the, the heightened expectation and, and desire for all things to be righted? Is that all he's saying, or is there something actually concrete to that image that he's speaking? I don't know, but maybe, right? But we don't have that answer, and God doesn't reveal it to us. He doesn't then speak eloquently or speak to the issue. He just gives it and leaves it. And we are there to ponder it then as his people. Uh, getting a little bit to the end of, of, so if you skip with me over to Exodus then. Thoughts or questions about that one as we go to Exodus? Yeah, Tidra. Uh, what about the mark that you gave to Cain? What's the mark you gave to Cain? I have no idea. Why does it keep people from killing him? I have no idea, right? Don't know. Don't know. He's just that ugly? Don't know. Is it, <laughs> is it that he, uh, if he had like some kind of brand on his head? I don't know. Like, we don't know. Uh, God doesn't talk about it again. It's not spoken of again. So, we don't know. In Exodus chapter, that's a great question though. It's one more of those things. Exodus chapter 4 uh, is when Moses is starting to confront Pharaoh. So I want us to, to listen to a few things in this early section of Moses confronting Pharaoh and think about some of it here. So Moses chapter, uh, Moses, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. And the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand in his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Uh, if they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they don't believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some uh, water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Okay? So we have these kind of three signs all laid out for us in that section. So now skip with me to chapter uh, 7. Chapter 7, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, 
Then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it on the ground before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. All right, now uh, skip just a few more uh, verses with me to verse 20. Because remember, that's not the last one, right? So verse 20. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servants. He lifted up his staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stink, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Okay, now skip with me to chapter 8, verse 5. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts, and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Now go with me a little further to verse 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast, and the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen. What plague is the gnats? The third, right? I mean, the, the, the snakes aren't a plague, right? Well, maybe to some people. But they weren't actually plagues for Egypt. <clears throat> what happened there? Magic. Well, in the children's movie Prince of Egypt, they just swap in fake snakes. Or, you know, they just have snakes and they just throw them in there. Yeah, so in the cartoon uh, Prince of Egypt, they're just con artists, right? But is that how the Bible depicts them? No. no. By their magic and sorcery arts, they conjure the same things. Make it turn to blood. They are able to summon frogs by their secret arts. Okay. We ended last week talking about this a little bit. There's a reason why the Ark of the Covenant, when it's stolen by the Philistines, goes into the cities of Philistia, and there it's put in the, the uh, Temple of Dagon. And when they come back the next morning, the statue has fallen over of Dagon in front of the Ark. They put the statue back up to kind of re remove move the ark around a little bit. They come back the next day. Not only has the statue fallen, but right at the threshold of the door, the head is broken off and the hands of Dagon are broken off and tumbled across the threshold. And everyone's getting tumors in the city. And so they're like, OK, pack that thing up, move it to the next town. Go away. <laughs> So the next town takes it, they start getting tumors. So eventually they're like, we're just going to put this thing on a cart with some oxen, and we're going to whack them and make them go. And if they, if they just wander around and stop in some random field, this isn't from the ark and the god who it represents. But if it goes straight back to where it came from, we know that it's God that's been cursing us, the, the Hebrew God. So they're just like, whack, and like, like a beeline right back to Israel. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, right? Did that make them then worship the God of Israel? No. no. The lesson they learned was they put the statue back up, and the priests from then on would step over the threshold and make sure they didn't step on it, because that's where the head and the, the hands broke off. 
Why is that when God clearly showed among them that? Because they believed in the power of Dagon because they had seen it. Just like the Egyptians here. Same with the uh, 500 prophets of Baal, all out there all day, cutting themselves, calling on them to burn the sacrifice with Elijah. They're not out there because they're stupid. Well, maybe some of them. But they're not out there by and large because they're stupid. They're out there because they really believe that Baal's going to come and do something for them because they think they have seen him acting in their lives and in the world. They've called on things to happen, and they've happened. So they fully expect, fully expect that Baal's going to answer, and he's going to burn the stuff, and are surprised when it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because God's like, no, and it's not happening, right? But it's not because the demonic that they're worshiping, thinking it's some god, are incapable of maneuvering them into that. So what does that mean for us? I have no idea. Except that we shouldn't take for granted that just because they didn't understand what they were doing, that therefore it was useless. So when Elijah, called, when Isaiah says, when God says to Isaiah, you know, they're worshiping stones, they're worshiping wood, lifeless things, that is true. These statues have no life in themselves. But the fallen powers have no problem taking those things and running with them in order to draw them away from the truth. And if it if they have to do some little tricks to make it happen, if that's all it takes, fine. Right? But we can see that it's not without merit. Right here, especially in this you know, Exodus passage, where they clearly are making these things happen, or are happening because of what they're calling on to make it happen. And they're not calling on God, right? They're calling in opposition to God's messenger. And God's allowing it to happen because then he's going to trounce them, right? So, so God lets it walk so that he can show definitively that he is a different God from their God. And then he goes on to destroy all of their gods uh, in the end by the 10th plague, has wiped out all of their gods in terms of power. And so God's doing something there by design. But on our side, we've got to rec recognize that it's not just because these people are gullible. And it's not just con artists out there. You know, this isn't just... Oral Roberts or something. This is this is a thing. Okay. Comments or questions about that? Jonathan. No, it gets me on the on the magician. Rather than taking away the frogs, they make more frogs. I mean God's gotta be laughing here. It's like, oh, you didn't want frogs, now you get more. You added more blood, right? <laughs> right? They don't take it away, but they show they can make the same plague. If Pharaoh wanted them to, they can do it, right? So you shouldn't believe in their God, because our gods are just as destructive as their gods, right? Just as powerful, right? But also for harm and not for healing. That is a good point, right? Yeah, and a telling point. Other thoughts? Uh, Steve? So the worshiping of demons, uh, possibly through wood and stone, does that also coincide with more or less man worshiping himself since he makes the idols? Yeah, so we, we form our own rules, we form our own understanding of what we want to happen, and then on some occasions, like the Egyptians here at this time, at least in this time and instance, right, uh, the demonic will act in some way to corroborate their own thing that they have made up, okay? Another example, just to make it weird, all right. Move down to Leviticus here. So God's giving the Levitical laws, telling them what they can do and what they're prohibited from doing. Some of those laws are ceremonial, some of those are uh, uh, civil, and some of them are moral. Okay? Here he's talking about sacrifice where they're supposed to sacrifice as an introduction about kind of how they're supposed to do it. You're supposed to go to the tent of meeting, and you're supposed to do it in this way, and the priests are supposed to do it in this manner, okay? Now go with me all the way down to verse 7 of chapter 17. 
So having said that you sacrifice in this way as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, by contrast, verse 7, so they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to the goat demons after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout the generations. Is anyone not reading the ESV? Does anyone have a different translation with them at the moment? Okay. So, does it say goat demons there? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm writing in the same thing. Oh, okay, okay. It says goat idols. Goat idols, okay. Think about the difference between those two, right? She'll no longer sacrifice it. Now, now lest we think that maybe, okay, this is just some kind of like golden calf incident kind of thing, right? Flip to Isaiah 13. And you'll see how delicately people handle this. Where is that in the, uh, I don't know if anyone has the books off the shelf there. I'm sorry? 577. 577, okay. All right, and 1321 is 1113 in the study Bible. Okay, so he is, uh, God is speaking uh, judgment on Babylon and judgment in general on the, those that are against his people and, against, and those that commit idolatry, okay? So, and what the day of the Lord coming is like. So, but this is incidental to that, but in verse uh, 21 it says this, but wild animals, so in the, in the uh, desolation that the wrath will, will, will follow it after God's wrath. But wild animals will lie down there, and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell, and there, in this translation, wild goats will dance. It's not wild goats. Okay, the Hebrew is the same. It's goat demons. Okay, in Hebrew, literally, it's satyrs. So, you're thinking about the half man, half goat. Not Mr. Tumnus, because that's the nice, nice version. This is, uh, <clears throat> for those, those of you that know Narnia, this is, this is the goat demons. Okay. Same thing in chapter 34. Same thing. Out in the desolate places where the goat demons dwell. No, I have not. I have not seen that. Yes, do. That is very intriguing. Yes, I would be curious to see people dancing like goat demons to celebrate the opening of a trans-European railway. Wow. Okay. Okay. So if you look at the last one there, Second Chronicles 11, uh, this is about Jeroboam and Rehoboam. So Solomon dies, and the kingdom splits between his son Rehoboam, who's a moron, and is greedy. And when people say, boy, Solomon worked us hard. How about you, you cut us some slack now that we built all his stuff? And he's like, you think my dad worked you hard? Like, you haven't seen anything. And they're like, okay, we're done, right? And so they rebel against him, and they raise up a king in the northern part. And so now you have northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah, right? Well, the northern kingdom sees that Jerusalem is still in Judah, and they don't want their people wishing to go back there. So, this is what happened. So, Chronicles chapter 11, uh, verses 13 to 15. Is that right? Yeah, okay. I just can't read. Okay, here we go. And the priests and the Levites who were all in Israel presented themselves to him in the places where they lived. For the Levites left their common lands and their holdings in Israel and came to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons cast them out from serving as priests of the Lord. 
and he appointed his own priests for the high places and for the, in this case, they translated it the goat idols and for the calves that he had made. Okay, but this is again the same thing. Okay, same word. And it shows up again in 2 Kings as well, um, where during Josiah's reign, they take down, the high priests take down uh, the Asherah poles and the Baal poles from the high places, and then also take down the, the things to the goat demons. So, um, this is a prevalent thing. And it talks about them being out in the wilderness, in the desolate places. I have no idea what that is, okay? Other than goat demons out in the desolate places, right? I, so what do you do with that? And I, my answer is, I don't know, okay? Other than that this is, this is a thing that they're treating as being, this isn't allegorical, right? They're not pretending that something's there that isn't. But it's something that we don't have any reference for as people in modern day America, right? Just not a thing that we even count. Oh yeah, the goat demons. Yeah, when I'm out, when I'm out in the prairie, you know, they, you know, there go the antelope because the goat demons chase them. Like that's not a, not a thing we see, right, and talk about. You've never really been around a goat, clearly. Those are the devils. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, they're. Oh yeah, don't get me wrong. Goats can be devilish, that's for sure. Um, but we see here, you know, things we don't know. Um, same with these. We won't necessarily go through all these. But what we find is, again, the prophetic powers that these guys have, uh, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, in, in 1 Kings 17, you have Elijah, who is living with uh, the woman outside of Israel. And, you know, they have food because of the miraculous uh, blessing of God on her oil and her flour, that it never runs out. And then her, her son dies suddenly. And he takes him up to his room and lays him on the bed, this child. And then he lays on top of the child and lays his hands on his hands, his feet on his feet, and his face on him. And he breathes into the kid's mouth. And the kid comes back to life. Why? I don't know, other than that God's acting in this miraculous way. But why that? Don't know. But it is interesting that he knew kind of what to do. I don't really have a record of him having to do anything like that before. Or in, uh, <clears throat> if you flip to 2 Kings 4 there, so back from Chronicles. Sure, so we would say the Holy Spirit is guiding him for sure in that, right? But we don't have any frame of reference for that kind of thing, right? We have CPR. But that's definitely different than what he's doing, the way that he's doing it there. Okay? Or we have this moment where Elisha, in a very similar fashion, uh, is living with the Shunammite woman, and her son dies, and she, she goes, travels all the way, because Elisha's not present with her anymore, uh, travels all the way to him to let him know that her son has died. And so if you look, starting at verse 25, yeah, of chapter 4, Note this, it says, And when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi came, uh, his assistant, came away to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, she is in bitter distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. And then she said, Did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? And so then he tells him how to go, and uh, Elisha goes to the house and does the same thing Elijah did, and lays on him, and then breathes on him, and then he comes back to life. Okay? But the part here that really, for me, is very intriguing, I mean, that's intriguing enough, but the part that really intrigues me is Elisha's response to what she says when she initially comes. She's in great distress, and what, in verse 25? Yeah. And he says... She's in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me, and has not told me. Now, what kind of statement is that, narratively speaking? Guess what the pastor's thinking, I guess. 
It's surprise, right? He's not saying it as a declarative statement, right? Like, the Lord has not let me know what this is, right? As if, as if he, this is him fully expecting that God would reveal this kind of thing to him, and it hasn't happened, and he's surprised that this lady's coming in great distress, and he has not been forewarned about it from God, right? Why would he be surprised by that? As a pastor, I'm always surprised by that. I never have a heads up. <clears throat> and yet here he is with a heads up all the time. Or again, later on, when uh, the, the siege of Bin Hadad comes, right? And he's able to know when the Syrian raiders are going to come, such that with enough time that he warns the king, the king warns the town, the bandits come to raid the town, there's nobody there because they've evacuated the whole town. And it happens again and again and again. And the king of Syria finally goes, who is in my bedroom as a traitor when I'm thinking these things? And they're like, well, no one's a traitor, but Elisha seems to like know, like have, have ear to you in your bedroom, that even as you're speaking these things to yourself, he already knows. So then he goes, well, as if that's not strange enough, then he goes, well, we're going to tell me where he is and we'll go just take care of him and get rid of him. So they find out what city he's in. They surround it with their chariots and uh, Gehazi, his, his uh, ever, <clears throat> ever not great servant, comes up to the top of the, the city walls, sees the army, freaks out, goes and gets Elisha. Elisha comes up, looks around, and Gehazi's like, we're doomed. And does anyone remember what, what Elisha says? Yeah, Elisha, Elisha goes, hey, God, show him what I see. And Gehazi suddenly blinks, and there's chariots of fire, this huge army of God all the way around the Syrian army, much larger, just covering the hills. Right? And they're like, oh, and strike him blind. And then they all go blind, and then he leads them into Israel's camp, and then they actually throw them a party and send them on their way home, and then he doesn't raid anymore because he just got owned. So, <clears throat> but in that, what we find is Elisha is not taken aback by this fiery army of God showing up. He's not taken aback by these revelations about the raids. He's not taken aback by any of it. It's just a part of being a prophet of God. That's weird to us as people today. And lest we say that's just the Old Testament, if you flip to Acts, you find much the same kinds of ideas. There's even a weirder one in, in 2 Kings, which we won't look at. Later on, Elisha dies, and he's in, his bones are put in the field, and these raiders, and so these other people are taking a, a loved one who has died, they're taking the body out in a funeral procession to bury the body. And these raiders are coming in to attack the town. And in panic, they drop the body and run. When they drop the body, it says it lands on the bones of Elisha. And the guy is resurrected and gets up. Just from his, his dead body landing on Elisha's dead body. Causes him to rise up again to life. What do you do with it? Right? Okay, last little bit. We'll... Uh, Acts 19 is sons of Sceva, where <clears throat> seven sons of Sceva are trying to cast out demons. And the demon says, well, I know who Paul is, and I know who Jesus is. I don't know who you are. And takes all their clothes and kicks them out. <laughs> Beats them all up and makes them run. Um, when I was in, <clears throat> when I was in uh, seminary, that was my online moniker was sons of Sceva. <laughs> so that was hilarious. But just a few, a little bit later, right, like one chapter later, uh, you have this move of Paul's. So Paul is preaching. It goes late into the night. <clears throat> People start falling to sleep. Okay. So verse 9. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and were not a little comforted. So Paul just goes down, like the guy falls out the window and dies. 
And Paul just goes down and holds him and goes, and just like grabs him and goes, ah, he'll be fine. And then he's revived and he's not dead. God, he just resurrects him there and then goes back inside, finishes teaching and eats dinner. Like it's no big deal. Right? And the people aren't just, and, says, and the people were, you know, were comforted. Yeah, I bet they were, right? Eutychus just died. Oh, no, it's okay. No big deal. I got him. Okay, where was I? Right? Like, right? It, what do we do with these things as the people of God? What do we do with them? Cindy. Yes. So one, we recognize that we don't have all the answers. Little humility here, right? Two, our God is a powerful God. Okay? He's bigger than the goat demons, right? He's bigger than all the forces that these magicians and sorcerers can muster with all the power of the demonic and Egypt behind them, right? That God can take moments and bring miraculous things to them. And he's not doesn't have a problem doing so if it serves his greater purposes. Okay, we have uh, someone that's a member uh, related to our church who uh, seriously everyone thought was about to die recently. Like they were on death's door, and now they're not. Like complete 180 on that. And they're not perfectly healthy yet. But the move from like okay, any day now you're going to die to well, we'll try this treatment and see if it doesn't, you know, fix the rest of everything that went away. And the, the, the people, have, uh, the doctors have no idea how it happened, and they, they say, well, we don't know what else other than it's a miracle of some kind. Right? Those things still happen. Why? Because God is providential. We have a good God. So why doesn't it happen to everyone? I don't know, because I'm not God. Right? Except that God brings good even out of the evils of the world. And that's where a lot of our spiritual warfare talk is going to go, is into that move of God takes the brokenness, the work of our sinful natures, the brokenness and death in the world, the evil things of the world, both man and demonic, and he turns them on their head. And he brings good out of it for the people of God. And uh, so we're going to be looking at that as we go forward. Tony. Did the Jewish Kabbalah tradition come out of the Old Testament? That's an occult question. Uh, yes, uh, sort of. So they, so that's, the question is, does the Kabbalah come out of the Old Testament? It does in some sense. If you read certain parts of it in a mystic kind of way, they derive these kind of conceptual ideas from it. And then a lot of the intertestamental stuff and the stuff that is out of our framework for Old Testament, but is in rabbinic traditional literature, you pull all that stuff in and then you start moving into some of the Kabbalistic literature at that point and Jewish mysticism. Uh, the, was it the sixth and seventh books of Moses or something, which are, which are uh, actually like witchcraft books, essentially, Jewish witchcraft, um, which were big among the Germans in, in Luther's day, even in Walther's day. You would have people call the, call the pastor in to come give a blessing on their sick child. And if you opened the closet, you would find the, you know, the healing lady of the village in there hiding while the pastor was there so she could come back out and continue using her you know, spells to try to heal the kid too. Right? Like that, was, that was how it ran, uh, even, in, even, in, even in Europe, in, in parts of Europe, okay? so, uh, which you still kind of see a lot of that in places even today, uh, here and there. So, uh, so those things are still, still out there with the Kabbalah and stuff. But it does have those roots to some degree in the Old Testament. But it's reading it allegorically and reading it in a mystic fashion rather than just reading the, the narrative. Yeah, you'll follow it. Well, we, all, we would actually say not only that it works, but it's a mis complete misreading of, of the text, right? That, that the idea of some kind of mystical magic that we can derive from the ethereal universe that God created is more of a, more of a cult uh, perspective rather than a biblical one. Um, so that's more like the Gnostics, that gets closer to that kind of heresy versus 
something that we would say is actually biblically accurate at all. Yeah, so we would say it goes past works into, into a false understanding of, of faith and religion. Yeah, Laura. It's yeah. The yeah, the scapegoat. Right. So that's Leviticus six. That's right before that text with the goat demons we were talking about. Okay. So is there any relationship between that and why they chose goats to have as idols? I don't know. Uh, the goat itself uh, has a particular title in the Hebrew. It's called Azazel, the one that they put all the. The, the sins on and cast out into the wilderness, right? And some, some traditions have said that those two things are the same thing, that the Azazel goat is actually uh, a goat demon of some kind, that they like grabbed and then put this on and sent it out or something like that, or that these two are correlated in some way. Um, biblically speaking, just in a straightforward reading of the Bible, those two things are two different things. Um, the goat seems to just be a goat that they have chosen to put the sins uh, on and send out into the wilderness to, to rec recognize that God has removed the sins of the people on the Day of Atonement, that the blood of the sacrifice has, has covered them and the sins are away from them that have been taken away, right? And of course, we see that all fulfilled in Christ uh, in its full and complete understanding and extent. Um, but that is, that is different from, from the goat demon. One is... Uh, where we get the word Seder from, you know, S-A-T-Y-R, and the other is uh, Azazel. So they're two, two very different words in Hebrew, uh, for sure. Yeah? So, last week I was thinking, is something as seemingly innocuous entertainment, the Wizard of Oz, and there's your good witch and your bad witch, and you're putting that in popular culture. Oh, yeah. So witchcraft is all over popular culture. The question is whether it's witchcraft that the Good Witch of the West, like, or e, whichever one, East? I don't remember. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen Wicked, and I haven't, I haven't done any of that. I haven't watched Wizard of Oz forever. My kids, I don't think you've even seen Wizard of Oz. I don't know whether that makes me a bad parent or not in America. But anyway, um, yeah, like that kind of stuff, I'm not really worried about, right? We don't really worry about fantasy literature where we talk about magic in that kind of innocuous way. The issue comes in when we start moving into it being something from which you're deriving a power, a secret power over which you can use to harness the mysteries of the universe or somehow pulls you away from truth in order for your own selfish gain, right? And that's what we see in, in actual, like, occultism uh, versus, let's say, like I said last week, like Harry Potter, where, you know, it's just bad Latin and an adventure, right? And the guy who wants to use it for evil, for personal selfish gain and to manipulate everything is the bad guy, right? Voldemort's the one that's doing all the evil magic stuff, right? And uh, on the other side, you just have the, the kids with the, being kids with sticks to poke each other with, essentially. Like, man, all those kids running around with those? Like, you better have magic to fix them because they're all going to die. Uh, just poking each other. All right, I'm digressing. Uh, we got a couple minutes left. Yeah. If I, you know, you bring the, God had Moses bring the frogs up, and the sorcerers are doing the same thing. Don't you think it had more effect if they just got rid of all the frogs? Yeah, that was mentioned over there earlier. Yeah, yeah. It, you would think that maybe getting rid of the frogs would show their power, but the way that the magician's system worked, showing power for power that they could do the same thing was somehow effective within, within the Egyptian understanding of 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 their faith, it's right? More effective if they did the opposite. Well, to us, we think so, but maybe not to the maybe not to the Egyptians. Yeah. Okay. Last thought, and then we'll probably close up. Yeah. Did the were the sorcerers able to replicate every plague? No. So by the time we got to the gnats, as we noted in that, by the time we got to the gnats, they were like, we can't do it, and they said, this is the Hebrew God, the power of God, of 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 the Elohim, and. Uh, and they, they didn't know what to do with it. And, but Pharaoh was still hard-hearted, so God could show his glory, right? And that's a different topic there. So next week, what we'll do is we'll, we'll finish uh, the sheet in front of you by looking at the different 
viewpoints uh, on this stuff. And then what we'll do is we'll get into those fallen powers themselves and then the biblical account of how God interacts on our behalf and, and our, our, not our role, but where we fall into place in all of this, okay? All right, so let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you again showing your hand here that we see so little of everything that you do. Um, just like Melchizedek comes and goes and is yet your high priest, and we don't know how that all is working. And, or when Elijah says he's all by himself, and yet there are a thousand others that are there who have not been to need a bail. Um, Lord, you are always working behind the scenes for your people, for our good, despite the brokenness of this world, despite the demonic forces that beset us. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us in this time with joy that we are in your hands. Bless us with your peace in the midst of the chaos of this world. And we ask, Lord, that you would protect us from the evil foe, from harm and danger, and that you would guide us continually in your truth. We pray these things in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.